Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my name is Dr. Jeff Raver. I'm CEO of the workshop. We've been in the cannabis space since 2010. Um, my background is bachelor's in biochemistry and a PhD in organic chemistry. I'm a trained synthetic organic chemist. Uh, I got my degree at USC. And since there's not many people here, like we can do this relatively informally. So. If you got a question on a slide, go ahead and ask me. Um, I will be peeking over to see what each slide says because I certainly didn't memorize my entire presentation. Um, but what I want to talk today about is standardizing your compositions and how if you're going to say this product is helpful to somebody or it's de delivering some sort of therapeutic effect or even if it's an, a recreational effect, it just needs to be consistent. So how am I sure in this compact, complex cannabis you know, world that every time I produce the product, it's exactly the same. And the definition of exactly, or how much can I control in a molecular sense, starts to become a, a lot more complex. Um, so there are, as you can see, you know, almost 1,300 different molecules known to be present in and on cannabis. That's a lot of them. We usually talk about a few, <laughs> right? Um, predominantly the cannabinoids. There are around 144 of those. Um, and some of those are produced by the plant, some of those are degradants of the natural processes like heat and time, some are oxidative pro products. Terpenes and terpenoids are kind of the next class that everyone has talked about. Uh, we first started testing for those in 2011. I can tell you back then no one knew what that word meant or were interested in those. We were asked if we were just trying to charge for another test for the sake of charging for more tests. Uh, we said, nope, we believe these things are going to be really important, and uh, lo and behold, I think today we all understand they have great relevance and importance to driving the physiological effects. Um, I, I like the analogy that if it's the cannabinoids or the gas in the car, the terpenes are probably the ones steering the wheel. So which directions you might go with that really is along the lines of which terpenes are in there. So we can take the same cannabinoid concentrate, put very different terpene formulations together and derive very wildly different physiological effects. So I think that really speaks to that entourage or ensemble effect. Um, and I'll talk more about that. I like the word ensemble effect uh, because I think all of them are at play. So it's a standardized cannabis composition, not just one THC molecule plus some buddies or CBD plus some buddies. Um, I think entourage is a little bit of a misnomer in that regard. And then flavonoids, there certainly is some very interesting uh, biological activity there. They're not very well studied. There was one recent report saying one of these has great anti-cancer properties, but many of the labs aren't testing for them yet, and our, ourselves, we haven't done much study in that realm either. Um, what we see mostly are some of the few cannabinoids, THC, CBD, their acid counterparts. Um, we're starting to see CBG isolate on the hemp market today. And typically, we have seen those in various ratios. Um, the flower presents them at certain ratios, and manufactured products could then hit predominantly any ratio that you would want. But there's an array of those, typically one to one, or you can go on either end from five to ones, one to five, or uh, 10 or even 20 to one. Um, there's a lot of, I think, interest in CBD products with zero to no THC being present, specifically for legal reasons. But I think those are mostly legal reasons and perhaps not the best physiological reasons. We see a lot better effects from a medicinal standpoint if there is some THC in some of those products. Um, so we can probably thank the government again for helping us not get there as effectively as we would like. Um, but as I mentioned, terpenes are very important to that entire cannabis composition and that whole plant effect, if you will. Um, an ensemble, it is important that you look at all of them, right? So the more I can look at, the better. The more I can standardize, the better. I think cannabis has taught us that. Single molecule cannabinoids have been approved pharmaceuticals for quite some time, like Marinol. We now have another one, that's, and that's THC-based. We have another one that's CBD-based, that is Epidiolex. But we see a lot of patients switch from, you know, medical cannabis markets with CBD and other cannabinoids to Epidiolex that come running back to the medical cannabis market because the efficacy was not as great. So I think modulating the endocannabinoid system and tackling some of these physiological ailments that we may be able to, you know, improve through the use of cannabis-based therapies are best off when we have more and more of those components as opposed to one single molecule. Um, the challenge is, most all the scientific data we have is on one single molecule. So somebody will study a molecule and say, hey, it does this. 
Therefore, marketing extrapolates and says, my composition has some of that, I'll make this claim. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, but we do know when you have more of them together, it's better than when you have just one of them. So what is in my whole cannabis composition and how do I make that consistent? I think that's the important part for today. Terpenes, as I mentioned, they're common in all plants, right? So there's about, the word terpene to a chemist like myself represents around 20,000 different molecules known on the planet. So there's a lot. The cannabis doesn't make all of those, but they're prevalent in almost all plants, and that's really what plants use to communicate with the environment. So they may ward off their pests, they may attract something that attacks the pests that are on them. It may be used to signal other plants around, like, hey, this is my space, not yours. It's the plant's language in a way. Like it's how they communicate with the environment because the poor little thing is just stuck in its position, right? It's not walking around like we do. Um, so it's interesting when you start to look at these and you start to say where are they prevalent in other, in other plants. Um, and other plants may produce them in much, much greater concentrations than we see them in cannabis. So that leads to, might I look to those plants or plant sources to capture some of those terpenes and is that single molecule isolate from say pine, pine trees much more cost effective to capture than anybody could with cannabis. Now today that's certainly more important because no one's legalized, you know, pine trees or made them illegal. They're everywhere. We can have tons of that stuff. But cannabis is still restricted. We don't have large amounts of that. And we certainly don't have every cultivar of cannabis maximized for um, say driving one component over another. Um, but I, I think it's always fun to think about what other plants they're in. We kind of recognize those. And they do have their own physiological effects and they're very important with the cannabinoids as well. When you talk about cannabis products though, not only is the chemistry of cannabis itself complex and very diverse, but the products kind of multiply that and then multiply it again by mode of ingestion. So I have a lot of different molecules inside of each of the cannabis cultivars and there's a lot of complexity there. Then I can take those products in different forms. I can have the plant material directly, I can have concentrated forms of it, I can have products that are meant for sublingual or oral consumption or even topicals. Each of those ingestion modes represents different absorptivities, different types of physiological effects, and different formulation options or challenges, if you will and just kind of keeps multiplying the complexity, right? So if I have 10 to the power of 10 to the power of another 10, like it becomes a lot of possibilities. So while that's fantastic that we have a lot of opportunity, it can be exceptionally challenging to figure out which compositions are best for which ailments until I start to really make my composition consistently. So I think, you know, we see a whole host of potential. We've all seen you know, the list of medical ailments perhaps that the states could say uh, they'll be allowed for under a, a medical system. We see a lot of plant diversity and we're seeing a lot of product diversity. But are we getting what we want and are we really able to map the right product to the right consumer for that end use? Um, so I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about what we think we know. So it was very popularized that people would say all indigas create the sleepy sedative types of effects and all sativas cause this uplifting and awakening type of effect. Um, I think what we know now is that that is too simplified to be the case. There may be some basic generalities in that regard, but before the presence of lab testing, before genetic screening of cannabis, and before real good designations of any of those things, the guy in the corner needed some way to market his bag, <laughs> essentially, and said, hey, this is going to do couch lock sleepy, and this one's going to make you a little more awake and alert. Which one would you like? So given that they could only kind of say indica sativa, that was what the marketing was based on. Um, I think what we now know today is that is really good to say this is how the plant looks in a morphological designation. This is how long it takes to grow and its flowering and cycle time and what economic considerations may be for how you plant it or which, uh, what rates of farming you're gonna use for that. But that those classification systems kind of end there. They don't really dictate physiological effects. Um, what recent genetic screening has said is all cannabis uh, is not cannabis sativa um, and cannabis indica. It's cannabis sativa subspecies sativa, cannabis sativa subspecies indica. So genetic profiling, uh, they call it DNA barcoding, uh, was done by John uh, McPartland at um, GW. He did a great amount of work to kind of demonstrate that these are subspecies and not individual species. It's 
legally important because everyone's kind of allowed cannabis sativa L. So if there was a different species of cannabis indica, we'd be in a lot of trouble and everyone would be massively confused. But fortunately, the science worked out that that was not the case. Um, but in the past literature, there's a lot of arguments about is it sativa, is it indica, how do we classify these things? And I think that's as much, you know, might be a, a categorization and biological arguments. It doesn't dictate physiological effects because these um, certain cultivars may still produce different types of chemical profiles in the end. So from a patient standpoint or a consumer standpoint, what molecules am I ingesting? What am I holding in my hand at the end? I'm not really as concerned as this a sativa or indica unless I knew that specific sativa generated high amounts of terpinaline, which would lend towards this likely effect. Um, we still don't have a great classification system for that. It's going to take a lot of effort and a whole community to kind of do that. Um, and I think what I want to note here is as I take the plant material and start to process it, I start to lose all of those types of designators. So all of the other secondary molecules like terpenes and things that really start to split that in a physiological sense really start to go away as I process. Um, and as I mentioned, we started testing terpenes back in 2011 because we saw well, these have the same cannabinoid profile, like these three different plants, but they look different, smell different, taste different, and I feel different. So what else is going on there? We kind of followed our nose, our chemical nose in that sense, and said, let's go look at terpenes. And you could see that those terpene profiles were wildly different. So even though the cannabinoid profile looked the same in the analytical equipment, the terpene profile looked wildly different. And we published this work in 2015 is our principal component analysis where I take a large data set of many variables and I try and mathematically determine what spreads the data the best and then through that spreading which ones cluster and that will tell me how similar they are to each other and um, what you see here is when we looked at it and this is as they were labeled to us we took it from the consumer perspective if someone said sativa if someone said hybrid or someone labeled it you know indica Ideally, I should see three circles and that would be it. And what you see is there's some on the top on the left there, and then this kind of continuum, it didn't really separate into three, meaning that that indica sativa hybrid morphological designation didn't match the chemistry. It, it was good for morphology or perhaps marketing, but it wasn't telling us which molecules were present. Um, and I think that's how we can kind of understand some of that today. Now what we could see was linalool and linalool and limonene were very important to kind of pull things out into the right. And terpinaline and nerol, when they're in higher concentrations, we're taking them up into the left. So we do see some separations based on which molecules are there, but the names were definitely not matching. Some names are much better than others. Um, we took a, a close look at only a few. And you can see, like, you know, train wreck was pretty good, but is a little too popularized because you have the outliers in the bottom. Same with Jack Hare. Um, you know, those are very distinct because they're high in terpinaline. You can kind of notice them to the nose. But something like OG Kush was pretty much going across the entire map because the name's very popular. Someone almost always called it that, but it had no mapping back to the chemical designations. Um, and we saw this in both the state of Washington and in California. So it was a pretty prevalent problem. What that means is no one standardized compositions according to name, right? So farmer one may have what he believes and calls it OG Kush. Farmer two may do the same thing, but that doesn't mean that their molecules are the same. So from a consumer perspective or a patient perspective, I can't go and be expected to get the same physiological response if I bought farmer one's OG Kush at this dispensary and a week later bought farmer two's OG Kush. I might get very, very different effect. Um, now if I'm just playing physiological roulette because it's for a recreational purpose, that might be okay. But if I really need it for medical purposes, that's absolutely not okay. And if we're gonna advance cannabis in a medical sense, then we're gonna really need to understand that much better. This one really disappointed me because despite us doing stuff in 2015 and everybody trying to say that this is different, I get large press uh, like Vice saying it's all the same. <laughs> it's not really helping us guys. Um, so I think the point of this is even today, you know, despite some people knowing and lots of educational efforts, there still is a misnomer that it's all cannabis is the same. Now I think we're, we're starting to see the collective know a lot better than that, even though the headlines might not represent that. But there's still a lot of work to be done in that regard. Um, and that's why we take, a, take it upon ourselves to kind of do these educational things. 
So in quick summary, what does this tell us? That terpenes are exceptionally important to deriving a chemical classification system. Indica sativa hybrids, not really that useful in telling you what effects you might get. And we're gonna need to move to a much more, unfortunately, complicated chemotyping system to kind of start to standardize what composition am I holding and what physiological effects might I get from that. And I will be honest, it's still a ways off from anybody really figuring out how to do that well or harmonize that. So what am I left with today is the best information that everybody can provide through testing labs, what they're putting on the labels, what are being provided by C of A's, and really your own nose too, right? Because terpenes are you know, volatile compounds, you can smell them, you can train yourself to recognize them, and you would be surprised how powerful your memory might be if you smell that same scent that you recognized from a while ago and had a good and or bad experience. Um, so we're kind of at that point today. I think we're gonna continue to evolve, hopefully faster than, than not. Um, but testing regulations are pushing that. I think product purveyors are really trying to demonstrate they're different by putting more information about their compositions. And as testing labs become much more competent at testing for more of these, we'll see more of that come about as well. Um, I think if you have a sense of how the product's made, you can start to understand where the composition may change throughout that process. Um, plant material, even though Farmer 1 and Farmer 2 may have started even with the exact same clones of OG Kush, they may have grown them in very different conditions. So Farmer 1 might prove to have indoor in a certain geography with their own hydroponic system, nutrients, lighting, humidity, and controls. And Farmer 2 just throws his outdoors and says, I hope Humboldt's the right area for this one. They will end up with two very different chemical profiles in the end as well. So even if I start with the exact same genetics, my environmental influences may really control the end composition results. So to standardize plant compositions in a consistent fashion for medical purposes is a very, very costly endeavor. I don't think you're going to see anybody doing that in the hemp market today. They're all throwing it outdoors as cheap as I can farm it. And that would mean that if I got, you know, hemp farmers, pick your favorite flavors name this year, next year it might be very different, even though they started with the exact same genetic stock. Um, standardizing that is possible, but it's exceptionally challenging. And not only do I have to worry about how they cultivated it, but how did they dry it, cure it, package it, what were their conditions all the way into that package, and how did it get to the end consumer. In infused products, we have a whole other variable, and that's how did I extract it and make the product in the end. And I'll step through a couple more uh, of those steps in detail. And when I do extractions and product manufacturing, I'm significantly impacting the terpene profile. So those things are very delicate molecules, they're very light, very volatile, and they can disappear like in many ways, and or isomerize, change, or become different molecules than what you first thought you had. Um, I don't know if there is any one, you know, I don't favor one method over the other. There are different reasons why you might think certain extraction methods are more favorable than others. Some are much more scalable, some are more economically favorable. Um, some have, you know, limitations in scalability because the capital equipment is so expensive, CO2 processes, for example. Um, but all of them kind of pre present and create their own output. So even if I take the exact same plant material and put it through each of those multiple primary extraction processes, I'm going to get some sort of different composition in the end. So what does GW Pharma do? They have standardized their cultivation, they have standardized their extraction methodologies, and they come up with the same exact composition every single time. So it is doable, but we don't see many of that, or much of that at all, being done today in the cannabis market. And to do it, it takes great amounts of diligence, time, effort, and capital. And certainly, there's not a lot of that going on in this new emerging market. People are rushing their products to market, really trying to get out. And their first batch may have been awesome, but they could never replicate it. And they may not even know why. Um, could be because farmer keeps changing the genetics on OG Kush, or they keep fine-tuning their extraction parameters. There are a lot of variables that um, really need to be kind of paid attention to as you go about it. The other unfortunate piece is primary extracts are not where we stop. We all want higher purity things and uh, other products, and those secondary refinement methods further um, raise the potency, but when I'm doing that, I'm getting more likely one molecule or you know, mostly one molecule with a few around, take like 90% THC distillate, 
The other 10% are minor cannabinoids, but there's no terpenes left in those. CBD isolate, single molecule. There's nothing else. No other cannabinoids or terpenes left with that. So these other types of methodologies significantly impact the fate of terpenes, which we now know are important to driving your physiological response. So that's just a picture of a simple CO2 extractor. Um, and some methods, like I said, are more direct from the plant and might be a little bit more gentle in terms of what's being left on the product. Um, and there are a number of you know, parameters and conditions through each of those. And I just always like to stress, you know, safety first. CO2 operates under high pressure. <coughs> Hydrocarbons are highly flammable. Ethanol is flammable, but doesn't really require high pressure, but it um, is rather cost effective. Uh, and, you know, dry pressing methods or, or Keith and sieving methods are not maybe as scalable as we would like them to be. So there's probably artisanal approaches, there's scalable ones, and there's a variety of things that you'll see along the way. And I think pictures are usually worth a thousand words, so it's kind of helpful. The top left is the crude extract. The darker black one is once you decarboxylate that. And then when you go through and send it through the distillation apparatus, you can get nice golden oil that everybody likes because you kind of first eat with your eyes. Um, but at that point, you're left with a highly refined cannabinoid, right? There's no terpenes that are present. There aren't all the same cannabinoids present. There are very many changes that have gone through that whole entire process. And not only do I have like THC, well, THC wasn't originally on my plant material. Plants produce THC acid. Same with CBD and CBD acid. So what's represented in, in either the dark brown or the golden colors there have never been on the plant in those concentrations or in those compositions. So when I hear that someone calls this golden stuff a whole plant extract, I mean, that, that doesn't really make much sense at all, right? I put the whole plant in the extractor, but that's about the last point that it was ever the whole plant. After that, I started separating things, refining things, and trying to drive towards um, different ingredients for different reasons. And I think, you know, we're all familiar with the unfortunate vape news. Um, what goes into the products in the end, what are their end concentrations, what have I or have I not used throughout that process, and what is that end product formulation. So not only are cannabinoids, terpenes, and the plants components important, but what else have I added to the product? It could be what's the, the topical base and vape considerations, it's what's that inhalation excipient, that diluent that's used, and definitely do not make it vitamin E acetate. Right? So I think we now know that that has caused a significant amount of problems. Um, it was significantly unfortunate that that had happened, and it, um, there's a lot of reasons for that that I won't go into. But understanding what's in my composition, how did I make it consistently, and how am I sure that is going to create the end product that I want, when you have a license and you're someone that can be found, I mean, someone's going to sue you if you've got vitamin E acetate in there. Right? So I think the scrutiny on the industry has gone up as much as the legal liability and paying attention to what you're doing could be at like no greater level of scrutiny than it is today. Um, it's kind of both exciting and frightening at the same time, uh, especially if you're holding the licenses or involved in the supply chain. Um, which products that you're looking at also have different compositional concerns? So in terms of an edible, uh, I was just interviewed this morning with a reporter and they were asking about edibles. Why don't I feel the same if I take 10 milligrams in a brownie as opposed to 10 milligrams in a gummy bear? Um, we're not allowed to have gummy bears in California anymore, but in a gummy product, for example. That's because you might have very different rates of absorption or amounts of absorption of those products. So that end product formulation, especially for an edible product, can impact how much is delivered to the body. Um, that's where ingredients and other types of things are very important. And again, you know, not only do I have the standard safety screens, but what ingredients are used for which purposes, and how do I know that those are stable and consistent on the product, are all at that end product composition are kind of driving towards. So how do I control every single one of them? Um, I think a, a place that we can kind of look towards as to where maybe things are going would be Australia. They've got very strict and high standards, GMP type style standards saying, I want to know about every single component and compositional matter that goes into here and how you're showing me that you manufacture and create that time and time again, that that's always going to be the same thing. Um, what we've tried to do is started to uh, standardize some of the concentrates. So if I can make this concentrate consistent, then I can formulate it into end products from there, whether that be a topical, an edible tincture, or even an inhaled product. 
And how do we start to know which components are going, uh, especially for those for inhalation? Um, so we've started to set some regulatory classes of our own. We're trying to educate some of the regulators about those as well. And trying to say, you know, these are components that were only found in cannabis, or these are components that were found in plants. These are ones that, you know, might make some people uncomfortable, but we think they're still safe enough for this type of use. Um, and how we understand what their acceptable concentrations are for that type of use. It's important to note that there really are no inhalation standards for vape products. I think everyone's kind of only become aware of that recently. Um, but it's really not established, right? The nicotine market hasn't really had the FDA looking at them yet until more recently. And we're going to see it coming. I think we all know it's, it's really coming. And some states have kind of jumped ahead of that in somewhat unfortunate and improper fashions. Um, but I think they're all trying to do the, the best that they can. And it will be, over time, it will settle down and we'll, we'll get a little bit more of an understanding. So what I thought I would highlight with this was the difference in like my whole plant extraction, right? So everybody says, are only cannabis derived terpenes the safest thing? I'm here to tell you a molecule is a molecule. If I have limonene from oranges, it's the same as limonene from cannabis. And an analytical lab would tell you it's limonene. It wouldn't tell you where it came from. Um, and I think what the regulators currently don't know, and they say, we'll only allow cannabis derived things. The top picture is what the flower started with, and the extract result, which was a rosin pressing at this, was simple pressing, right? There should be very little change. You can still see a significant amount of change in that terpene profile. Some are lost in that process. Other extraction methodologies, it's been demonstrated, especially with CO2 extraction, that you see oxidation or isomerizations or different molecules that have formed from that original composition. So even though I'm using <coughs> cannabis terpenes, it doesn't mean it represents what was on that plant material to start with. They have changed in some fashion, whether it's relative ratios or even in complete composition um, isomerization or oxidations as well. Our approach uses how do I look at the plant and how do I replicate that using individual ingredients so that I can make the best representation of the plant material and I can recreate that every single time that I use that standardized composition. Um, we're using around 50 to 60 ingredients depending on the formulation so we have great control over a large number of composition uh, components and I think that represents one of the, the best approaches to saying this is the same portion for that time and time again. Now you can create the same standardized cannabinoid concentrations, certainly at high purity, and I can use individual molecule ingredients for that. So we're starting to get to a place where we can formulate using exact ingredients every single time, and that will then allow us to standardize our end product compositions in a much better way. So cannabinoid control is a key piece of that. Terpene control is probably the other major key piece of that. And then you can start going down to all of the other ingredients if you're going to use flavonoids or other types of molecules from other areas. Um, and then my end product formulation. What else is going in there and how am I sure that it's the exact same every single time? Um, and of course, we have to make sure that they're at the right purity. So if, especially if you're seeing these things go into immunocompromised people or patients that are um, you know, in an unfortunate physiological state, they may be much more susceptible to some of these things. But states have mandated, and certainly you know, there will be federal regulation along the lines. I am encouraged to see most of the hemp market is saying, I'm testing to some sort of state qualifications in some fashion, because the labs are capable and are doing that. Um, I think California represents some of the greatest testing standards that we see in the cannabis game today. They kind of evolved those after they had seen a bunch of other states do some things and kind of miss some stuff. Um, and California likes to do it the California way where they try to be more stringent on some of those than others. And they are testing for things like, you know, solvents, pesticides, metals, microbiological contaminants, and, and things that are of great concern in any sort of consumer product. Um, I think we'll see some more of that evolve and maybe some of those levels harmonize across the states. Um, and we'll also see what the FDA has to say about hemp products, but we don't see uh, what they're saying yet. And the U.S. Department of Ag is still struggling a little bit with um, their rules and how to determine THC content in the products. Once we have standardized compositions, then we can start to say, this is my final standardized product and it is ingested in this fashion. Um, even if I take the exact same cannabis concentrate, I can use it in different ways and get different physiological effects. So if I inhale it, it's going to be a different effect than if I orally consume it. 
than if I certainly topically apply it. So I can start with that same standardized composition and drive even different effects in different ways based on mode of ingestion. Um, inhalation is much more rapid and I get very different molecules in the bloodstream than if I orally consume and have first pass metabolism and then see that. I think uh, a good example is THC is five times more active at the CB1 receptor, the psychoactive one, than, uh, or the, the oral metabolite, 11-hydroxy-THC, is five times more active than THC itself. So orally, it becomes a little bit more of a delicate balance on dosing. There's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Oh, I inhaled 10 milligrams, so I should be able to orally consume 10 milligrams. Very different in that respect. But you only start to get that fine control when you've controlled your composition. Um, and I think that's what's, what makes things repeatable and will advance the medical conversation. So we always say, can I put the minimum effective dose, the med, back in medicine? I'm really looking to make these things as uh, effective, uh, physiologically effective and potent as, as possible so that they are utilized in the lowest possible amount. So the lower I can get the cannabinoid use, the less likely I am to downregulate cannabinoid receptors generating the need to use more. So if I have a broader whole plant composition, it should lend towards greater efficacy and less potential toxicity from too much cannabinoids. And as we're starting to see, unfortunately, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, you know, too much cannabinoids are not good for you either, right? So now that they're all out there, we're starting to see other things. There are upper limits for where that would be effective or not. And each individual is kind of sensitive or unique in their own right too. That individual can only kind of titrate and tolerate the right things for themselves if we offer them standardized compositions. Um, I think it is important to note, and also what we hear, like CBD is the only non-psychoactive component out there. That's not the case. Um, you know, THC is the only psychoactive component. Might be a lot better to say. Um, you know, and I would then argue, what's the definition of psychoactive? Right, so you're changing, you know, mood, mental states, even with things like CBD. So I think psychoactive is not necessarily the best term. We don't have great definitions for that. And I was asked earlier, like, what is whole plant? What is broad spectrum? What is full spectrum? What do these things mean? We really have no industry-wide accepted definitions of those. Um, so that can, can currently be a problem. I've also seen CBN causes you to feel sleepy. Um, don't think that's the case. CBN by itself, when people studied it in the 70s, it caused a little bit of hypothermia and loss of muscle control, but people were not going to sleep. Um, some users that we know have taken up to 100 milligrams of CBN and did not pass right out. So, and that was an oral dose, um, but that we don't believe that that is causing the sedative effects. It's probably much, much more complicated than one molecule doing these things. Uh, it's many more in your entire cannabis composition. So, as a crazy chemist, we like to look at these potential energy surfaces and say, how do I get to a really good point? And which point along the saddle point con uh, calculation here might be the optimal one for that patient? It could be one along any of those, or each of the patients has their own. That's good and bad. One, we can create lots of compositions to find out. Um, but two, we might have one patient per composition that's ideal for them. So it becomes a little bit of a challenge to manufacture and market those and really difficult if you're a patient trying to find the right thing. Patients will only get there if they can have standardized and consistent compositions. Um, and I hope I have at least impressed a little bit of how complex cannabis and cannabis products can be. Um, and I think we really need to work as a community to start to standardize our terms, to certainly standardize our compositions, and standardize how we are talking about them and introducing them to the market so that consumers can start to get expected effects. Um, and I do think we need to be a little bit more careful about some of the marketing terms and we will start to see, you know, FDA regulation, we're seeing lawsuits about some of that now and California says no more, you know, no marketing of specific effects without scientific substantiation in their regulated cannabis market. So I think you might even see other states kind of take some of that uh, approach as well. Um, and I'll leave it at that point and ask if there's any questions. Right? Or if I've just thoroughly complexed and confused everything. Uh oh, there's no questions. Come on, be brave. I'm a friendly guy, I'll answer one. Well, real quick, what about like um, water soluble, like nano or other liposomal formulations, and in terms of that 
again, that full spec versus broad spec. So sure. how does that all really work when you're going down to that level? So the claim of nano encapsulations in a, an aqueous or a water formulation yep. is that it improves absorptivity, right? So one, either I can get these oil droplets inside of water in a stable emulsion, right. and two, can I make that it lend towards better absorptivity? So I see a lot of the claims, but I see very, very little of any scientific substantiation behind it. So most people have said, this worked for some other molecules, it must be working the same for cannabis, I'll throw this stuff together and start marketing that, but I don't see the scientific data behind it. So determining that these particles are nano in size is a really difficult challenge. Mostly universities are the ones that have that, or really uh -huh. big pharma companies, that equipment's exceptionally expensive. And I haven't seen anybody demonstrate, hey, here's my particle size, here's my particle size distribution, and I can definitely tell you this is what is in my liquid formulation. Um, right. well, that's absorptivity would be easier. I can tell you, do I feel it faster? Right. Am I feeling the same effects if I do or don't do it with that? Yeah. Um, but that's sometimes individualized, and, and I might do that with blood level, right? Sure. So I can do blood So that's bioavailability, and I guess the premise is, when you make them smaller, it's more surface area because you're breaking apart the molecule, right? And so, but it doesn't mean my body wants to absorb them. Right. They might still pass through me just as fast. Sure. But what about this, the whole like concept of the full spec and broad spec? And so yeah, so plants. full spectrum, broad spectrum, whole plant, right? As it relates to nano, like, right. does it change the profile of that at all? No, I mean, if I say I have this like full, or let's just say I have this broad spectrum right. oil, cannabis right. oil composition, right. and I nano encapsulate that, yeah. All of those molecules, in theory, should go into that encapsulation. Okay. So, so I shouldn't necessarily change that, yeah. but I should have to prove that. And it right. is possible that maybe one or two of those molecules in this like the water better than inside that nano encapsulated pocket. Right, so so it's it possible that a few of those, you know, are kind of either hanging in between or right. just didn't get inside. Okay. So I can't say all of them are encapsulated, unless I really difficultly prove that somehow. That's a big challenge for sure. So marking claim wise, you could still say full spec nano encapsulation. What is full spectrum? I know what I'm just saying. I, mean, I, I don't have a good spectrum. definition for that one. So I, I see some people say that has a little bit of THC, or that doesn't, or right. broad spectrum does right. or doesn't. Right. Um, I read one full spectrum definition that if that was the definition, there's no product ever going to make it because right. that would the only one that would make it is the flower. Right. right. So as soon as I you know do any extraction, I'm leaving something in the extractor and taking something else forward. Right. That means I don't have whole plant anymore. Right. right. So what is in my composition? How much have I analyzed? So if I can tell you that this is 90% THC. What about that other 10% can I show sure. And I say that, well, it's 2% CBC, 3% CBG, 5% CBN. Right. I got all 100 here. Right. Oh, well, you actually know exactly what's in yours, but most of the time we don't, right? And the labs aren't really able to quantify all of those really little tiny things. There may be some trace oil or fats around or lipid type molecules that kind of go with that, but no one's quantifying all of that. So until we can say, you have to quantify these 100 molecules and tell me that they're 98% of your composition or greater, then you can define it as your full spectrum. Like right. I think it's just a meaningless term today. Gotcha. Actually, one other quick question. I've been thinking about this for a while in terms of adding terpenes back in. I know you're teaching organic chemistry and probably best qualified to answer this question, but you're kind of monkey with mother nature because you're not truly taking the whole plant extract. You're adding things back in as closely as possible how do we know really like the myriad, you know, potential, you know, astronomical amount of permutations sure. involved in like even taking out 10 out of like maybe the 70, yeah. 80, 100 terpene profile that you're not yeah. truly missing something right. critical for that whole plant interaction that you just might not get because you're playing, you're playing nature is what you're playing. So I like to think of it like we're following Mother Nature right. as best as we can. Right. And we probably aren't as, we certainly are not as capable as she is today at right. doing those things. Right. But can we get close enough that it satisfies our body? Right. And we don't know. For some people, right, it might take 25 components and you got it. But that same 25 component composition doesn't work for a larger percentage of the people, only mm -hmm. for a few. So I needed to get up to 50 or 75. And for some of them, that still didn't work. I had to get to 100. We don't know which ailments need which molecules at which amounts for which people and derived in which formulations to say that they're all absorbed that way, right? So I think you can say we're trying to take our best efforts today given what we can do to get as close to the plant as possible. We can make them consistently and is that effective for you? 
So if you're not making the claim that this is curing everything out there, you're saying, honestly, I'm giving you the same thing every time. I hope it works for you. You tell me if it works for you. If it does, great, we can keep giving that to you. If not, we'll go back and try something else. You can try other products or try to find something else that works for you. I'm not claiming it's gonna cure for everybody and everything, but we are saying that we can consistently deliver that. So the ones saying I have a full spectrum product or I've got a whole plant extract, are, are not as honest in that conversation because they're not saying that they are consistent. They're saying, I'm trying to market to you, saying I'm giving you what I think you want, but I don't know if I could give it to you again and I still don't know if it would work. So it's, it's almost like, a, you know, where are we at in that conversation today? And we're not, I mean, if you take all these molecules at ultra high purities and put them together, it is like what the plant provides to you, but that would be if you're vaporizing that plant material mm -hmm. or eating it directly. Right, if I combust it, things change. If I introduce it in other fashions, things may or may not be absorbed based on that. So it's really, how can I get to a place that's very therapeutically effective, being guided by nature, but I would never claim that I'm as good as the plant or replicating that directly either. Well, and therapeutically effective, we talked about entourage or ensemble effect, like that term better too. I was actually just in another seminar with a couple of PhDs in chemistry and they're like, we actually don't have any proof of an entourage effect from terpenes we do have proof from other cannabinoids, and we feel that most of the activity is the other major minor cannabinoids, and not the terpenes, and then... Um, the PhDs love to argue, by the way. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's how we get paid. <laughs> and then, but empirically, well, we will see that there is this effect with... Right, I mean, I think you can say files. empirically and anecdotally, you're yeah. seeing the effect. Like I said, right. like we've had the exact same cannabinoid concentration. You put right. 10 different terpene formulations, right. you're seeing different effects across the same and different people. That tells me they're active. Right. We know yeah. beta caryophylline has CB2 receptor activity, so it right. is modulating the endocannabinoid system. Right. We know some of the other ones have activity. Right. So they're active physiologically. To say that they have no effect right. is to try and think that, oh, if it doesn't impact this cannabinoid 1 or cannabinoid 2 receptor, sure. it's not going to have the effect they want. Right. And that is wrong, in my opinion, because right. the endocannabinoid system just keeps looking bigger, 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 and bigger. Sure. And the more I reduce it down to one molecule, one receptor, the more wrong I get in the endocannabinoid right. system. So only this, only that, like that's presuming you know everything today. So right. I, I don't like to take that approach because sure. I always look bad if I do that. Makes sense. So, Thank yeah. you. You had a question? And then I, you. Just a quick, I was just wondering what, what, to you, what's the difference between full spectrum and broad spectrum? It's supposed to be without the T, right? I think it's without the T. I think that's what most are trying to drive towards, like, yeah. but I, I so still, two different I mean, but that's not the only thing it's without. Right? So I, I, it's, to me, it's very hard. What's the difference is everything's different. The only thing that's the same is it's a garbage term, in my opinion. Right? So I'm saying something that I don't understand, don't know, and I'm trying to convince the public that I did. And I think that's kind of a dishonest marketing approach. And every, like I, the marketing people hate me. Yeah. Um, but that, that's OK. We're supposed to rub against them with science. So I think that's, you know, the danger of that is I said it was this when it wasn't. And I, I think that's just like, you're putting your brand in a position to be found out to be dishonest later. Like you're risking longevity and sustainability. So my thought process and position is always like, I can't say anything I'm not really, really sure of. And even when I'm really, really sure of it, I should still have the caveat that I may be wrong or found out later to be a little bit off. And I'll be honest about correcting that. But to come out and say like, I think this is the best thing for fill in the blank is like really not fair. And when you're found that that's not the case, your consumer's are like, liar, next brand. So you're hurting yourself and your brand and you're convincing yourself you're doing great. And you might get that first sale, but you're not getting that repeat customer and that's gonna hurt you and it definitely disappoints them and tarnishes the brand. So if you're building something for longevity and sustainability, it's gonna take a while, it's gonna be difficult and it may cause you to wanna be different than everybody else. So I think that those terms, I don't throw them around other than people always ask me to define them, but I have no definition for them because we haven't said it. And to me, I would want to define that in a molecular sense. And then like, then everybody really hates me because one, they won't understand what I'm saying, and two, we don't have it yet. So I, you know, I think that's the challenge. I think we can get there, but until you get there, like, why am I trying to say that? So I think it's better to say, I have a consistent cannabis composition with today's latest state-of-the-art testing and abilities. I'm doing my best to watch all the quality that I've got. And if it's working for whatever you want it for, I'm gonna give it to you again, because I'm really watching all of my consistent pieces. 
to the best that we can. Might find out I was a little bit off, but I'm pretty close today, and I'm just gonna fine tune till I am perfect in every molecule that I can capture, and that's just probably a matter of time. Or economics will say, I'm close enough today. So when you're, uh, the standardization you know, year after year with different crops is, is a huge, a good point. Um, however, then when you try to sort of Frankenstein and you, you create your own custom product, let's say you want to do something for sleep, so you have a lot of CBN or you, you, know, you put your scene or minor scene, or little, whatever you want to add, it's going to help with sleep. Um, how do you know how to create that? How much to put in? I don't think you do. Yeah. Yep. So how do you know how to create that? You'd have yeah. to empirically determine it, right? Um, I don't think you can just sit there and like someone says, do this, and you're like, oh, perfect. Here are your 20 things that you need to make that happen. Well, I don't know anyone that could do that today. Not in an honest sense. There's probably someone that'll tell you that. Um, yeah, and if someone asks, if someone asks us to do it, we're yeah. like, look, I don't know. I'm going to take my best guess based on all that I do know. But you gotta go try it out in sample groups and really make sure of that, and I wouldn't advocate marketing for that, but I am making no claim to that composition. I am only telling you it's consistent. So however you wanna choose to market it or go out there and put it forward, you know, have at it, that's you know, kind of on you, but here's the best that I can support it with today's science. I can tell you where I came up with some of the rationale in some sense, and a lot of it is based on our broad-based kind of profiling you know, efforts across the cannabis community. But it's as much a you know, a little bit of a, almost a shamanistic feel, if you will. I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, but we know from experience that these things kind of drive you in this way. So we'll start with that, and we'll try and make enough variance around it that we hope to find one that wins. But we are quite often unsuccessful, too. And so when you do formulation, right? That's what the workshop does a lot? Yep. Um, so do customers come to you and say, I want products can help more with focus, or I want one more? And yep. then you, you we get some of that. We also get some of the, I want them to taste this way. I want to make a product of this form. You know, I'm not sure what ingredients would be in there. What do you recommend? Um, and some of it, I think you're also hamstrung with economics and availability of ingredients today. Um, some of the things that we might be able to create five or 10 years from now are just not available today because no one's manufacturing those things. Um, or no one cultivated the right plants to give you the raw materials for it. So I think you're like, you know, it's kind of weird. I don't think anything works in that sense, even though I believe you could. And to get the right thing, we probably need to grow different plants to do it. Um, and they're just not broadly available. So some things you might be better at than others. Um, but a lot of what we're asked to formulate is end product type formulation and a lot for taste or olfactory compositions too. And that we're really good at making it smell or taste the same way for sure. You had a question, too? Yeah, I think actually I asked some of it, but the other part of it is mm, from a financial perspective, how expensive is it to do something like that for a small company? Yeah, um, so grabbing ingredients from other plants are much more cost effective than cannabis derived terpenes because the orange juice industry sees limonene as a waste product. So I can get individual ingredients from you know, the paper industry, from orange industry, and get them all at ultra high purity and super low cost. So we can then take them and put them together like cannabis and still be cheaper than cannabis derived terpene sources today. Okay. Um, now, with, if that changes or not, perhaps, but what am I gonna capture from cannabis if it's gonna be an individual molecule, like I'm gonna get limonene from cannabis, still gonna probably have a hard time beating the orange juice industry in that one. Um, but there may be a few that, you know, cannabis does better than other plants and people start to grow those and we can isolate them. But again, you're back to saying, well, this one's cannabis derived, that one's not. But they're all still a molecule is a molecule. So that molecule is the same molecule. If I blinded that and told the lab, you tell me where it came from, they'd be like, I don't know. Mind me, you land. So it, I think economically, much, much more cost effective to get them from all the other sources than cannabis, especially today, because there's just not a lot of cannabis food. And do you think that as we move into the future, that more and more, because right now it's a lot of, um, a lot of people just doing generic stuff. Um, do you think that it is going to be, go more that direction where people are going to start I think it has to. different formulations? Yep. Like and, you have and, to sophisticate to differentiate yourself because tomorrow, if not already yesterday, everybody has CBD. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what else is different, right? right? How are you standing out right. or... Is that effective enough? Now, if that turns out to be effective enough, we may not see it advance. 
but I'm pretty sure it's not. So we're gonna see it advance to where everyone and all the consumers are like, this this now all works for me. This is great. I don't need you to go any further because I got the answer. Like even if you came up with the next advanced formula, I'm sticking with this one because I know it works. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. But I think that's, you know, will I go to this? If you say like there's this 100% replication point and then there's this single molecule point, where along this continuum do I find the socioeconomic balance in terms of perfection to say this delivers to 90% of the people, we're happy here and I don't have to go that extra mile. Because sometimes getting that extra little bit is just impossible economically. Um, also, it, it helped for me to hear you talk about like um, your opinion on the water soluble. Because everybody's talking about that. I yeah, people ask me about it. Expert, and I'm yeah. like, I don't really know. Um, the other thing is, uh, like, there's one of our competitors. You know, somebody came up to me and they were saying, "Oh well, our product is more bioavailable. Uh, have, have you done studies on bioavailability studies?" And, and they said, well, we have, we have. And so when you were talking about bioavailability, and they were, he was talking about his nanomolecules and all this, so, so. How did you do the bioavailability study, right? So sometimes I can design a study that gives me the desired endpoint, even though it's not an accurate study. Did an independent group do the study? Sometimes it is the right answer. Sometimes you may be right. Yours was more bioavailable than mine. I gotta go back to the drawing board and, and recreate the next thing. And I'll one-up you, right? Like it's okay to say we keep, you know, advancing and improving to try and drive to the best formulation out there. The more bioavailable, it will need less and less CBD to be more effective, right? right? So that's more cost-effective. That's better and safer for the consumers too. They're getting more of what they want, and less of what they don't need. Mm -hmm. So I think that is good to drive in that, uh, you know, that fashion. Does anyone have the ultimate answer? There are probably like multiple winning answers all around the same realm, and we may not have anyone there today. So it's possible if someone's there first that they get a large market share, it takes a while to watch that change. Um, but I wouldn't say if someone said that they did and they have some proof, be like, great, can I see the study? Can I know how you did it? Now I'll go replicate a study with myself. And if I'm not as good, I better work on my formula to go make it as good or better. So, you know, it's kind of like how many dentists said this gum was good or something. Like, all right, well, how many did I study? Did I ask five dentists or did I ask 50? Yeah. Um, you know, I get better data when I ask 50. But if I ask that right five, four out of five said they like mine. Yeah. So you have to kind of think about the study design and they may be right, right? I mean, you have to be like, okay, like it's possible. It's always competitive. But does that mean that that's a better product than mine? Maybe mine's a better price point because the way you got to that was so much more expensive and it was so marginal in the advancement that it wasn't worth it. There's a lot of factors that come yeah, to that too. But it might force your price point different if you are not at that point. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Come on. Come on. Um, maybe not totally related to your presentation specifically, but have you seen that adding CBD to a formulation affects the pH over time? It possibly could. So I can't say that we've actively studied that, but you can see where it would. So it is possible for sure. If that's the only thing that you've added, might it start to change? Yes. And have you seen the color change too? Yeah. Get darker? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it will react with the environment to start to do other stuff to the CBD molecule and that could definitely impact the pH. In terms of stability in general, like shelf life, um, we know light is a headspace. Yep. Those are like the, the temperature is the other one, right? So temperature always slows everything down and oxygen and light are the enemy of all of that. So all those are the worst scenario. How do I control them to the best possible ability? And sometimes that's too difficult in some of the products that we make. Okay. Um, so for the question, you know, we've been told that heat can break it down over time, but then some of the raw materials that we've been working with, they've told us that it needs to be heated before putting on Usually when they say like heat, it's a time and temperature thing. So it's how hot for how long, right? So I could say like take THC acid for example and I wanna, I wanna like warm it up to put it in a solution. But if I warm it, aren't I decarboxylating it? Well, there's probably a certain amount of time and a certain temperature that I can get away with to warm it up and put it in this form formulation. But if I left it there for two hours, I'll start to see it decarboxylate. 
right? So there's always a time temperature relationship. The hotter I go, the less time I have. So the general rule in chemistry is 10 degrees in Celsius doubles reaction rates. So every 10 I go up, the less and less and less time I have, and it really ramps up rather quickly. Yeah. Sure. What about non-cannabis derived cannabinoids? You guys do anything? Someone just asked me about. Cities. Sure. Uh, a molecule is a molecule again. Mm -hmm. I think the non-cannabis derived cannabinoids have a different legal thing. Right, so now, am I manufacturing a controlled substance and I'm not protected under the farm bill or a state regulatory structure? Uh-oh, <laughs> that's the really wrong three letters that are coming to kick in my door. Um, I think I just saw CBD from fruits was yeah. something that somebody advertised and I believe it, it definitely is possible. Biotechnology will say I can take the enzymatic pathways, I can you know, string them together in some sort of fermentation yeast process uh, and manufacture that ingredient. Am I allowed to? Am I now really in a realm that it's a pharmaceutical compo like component, right? So I really have much, much more of a regulatory FDA, DEA concern than I do is that molecule going to be as effective elsewhere. So it's, it's not really a science efficacy question. It's more of a legal am I allowed to question or am I in the wrong supply chain? Didn't mean to compl like complicate it for you, but that's really the no, answer for no. no. Someone was just asking about it, and I had like, CBD at 99% purity is still CBD, right? Yeah. My body's not going to know where it came from, and I'm not really going to care. But the legal guys, man. <laughs> so my body's going to care when it's sitting, you know, in the wrong position after that. But that's really where that one takes you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you guys for sticking around uh, for the conference later on, too. Appreciate it.